All right. Good evening, everybody. How is everybody tonight? Amen. Good. Good. That's good. Well, for those of you joining us online tonight, welcome. Glad that you're here. Um, we have a, uh, a double header going on here tonight at Orchard Baptist. We have um, our summer fun nights kicked off tonight, and we have three weeks of that, three Wednesday nights in a row. It's uh, Camping with Jesus at Lake Galilee, and so we're excited about that. So if you have children, uh, kindergarten through complete fifth grade, we'd love to have you here. Starts at 5.30 next Wednesday night. Um, we'd love to have you come and join that, and um, excited about that part. So they started at 5.30. We'll continue our regular adult Bible study also at 6.30 for the next two weeks as well. And um, so you can join us in, in many different ways. So again, glad that you've joined us, glad that you're here, and we're going to go ahead and kick off with a word of prayer. How about that? All right, well, let's pray. Father, we do come to you today, and thank you so much for all the amazing blessings, Father, that you give us. Father, we thank you so much because we know that you love us, Father, beyond measure. We know that you love us in ways that, Father, we can't even begin to imagine. We're so thankful to know that, Father, that um, you're here with us. You're, you're, you're with us. You're always watching over us. You're always protecting us. And so, Father, we're so thankful to know that you are here. And so tonight, as we open your word and we continue to study First John, Father, just help us to see whatever it is that you want us to see. Father, help us to know the things that we need to know. And Father, as we hear tonight and we uh, take these things to heart, help us to apply them in our lives, Father, that we may use it however or we come across people and, and the things in our lives. Father, tonight be with the children as they continue to uh, have a good time tonight and learn about you. And Father, we ask in all things that happen here tonight that you are seen high and lifted up. We ask it all in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. All right. So, Larry, I was messing with you a while ago. We are in chapter 4. He said 5, I said 3, so I figured I'd catch you in the middle. So, uh, we are in chapter 4 tonight. We finished up chapter 3. And, um, in fact, it's been a couple of weeks. And for those of you that are joining us online tonight, thank you for joining tonight. Uh, we did miss a couple of weeks. One was a scheduled event in which we took our children to Camp Whispering Pines. And, and I went to take part in that. And then last week, I uh, ended up having to have a root canal and, uh, on Wednesday evening. And so I wasn't able to be here. And I'm sorry about that. But we're back tonight. And we're getting right back into the Word. So we are in chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. So chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. And it says this. It said, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world. All right. So the whole thing is there are false prophets, and that means that we need to test the spirit. Well, what do you mean we need to test the spirit? Well, don't believe every spirit. John warned. He said, listen, don't believe every spirit. We can't assume that everything that we see happen that seems to be some kind of spiritual thing is from God. It might not be from God. We need to test it out. We need to see if it meets the requirements to make sure that it is, in fact, from God. We need to test and see whether or not it is from God. Now, what do I mean by this? Well, there are things that happen in the world today, right? And some of these things we can't explain. Anybody ever seen a, uh, a healing service? Anybody ever seen that? Sometimes there's a healing service that happens. And listen, it ain't nothing but fake. Now, I'm not telling you their healing service is fake. There are times when, when the Spirit's moving and when people have come, I've taken part of laying hands on someone and pouring oil over their head and praying for them, and God's healed them, right? So I'm not telling you that it's all fake, but many times when it happens, it might appear to be real, but instead it's not. And, and some of the more famous times that you see that is when the people come up and, and the man that called them up uh, says something to them and he smacks them on the forehead and they just fall backwards and all of a sudden miraculously they're healed. Well, a lot of times what we see here is it seems miraculous, right? It seems like something has happened and it, it's a miracle. But there are false prophets that are out in the world. There are false spirits. There are those who are trying to make us believe in something that's not real. So we got to test it. 
We have to test all that stuff out. Well, how do we test it out? Well, um, here's how we test the spirits. Uh, the responsibility of every Christian is to test the spirits, and that's what 1 Corinthians says. So testing the spirits means we need to look and see, is it biblical? We need to look and see, does it follow what Scripture said? Is it something that's glorifying to God? Is it something that, that as you can look at that and see, it's clearly something that God has ordained? And when you start trying to test that out, you can see that there are things that happen that absolutely are not true spirits of God. There are things that they may look impressive, but they're not. And so when we see here in verse 1, it says, Do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they're from God, because many false prophets have gone into the world. All prophecy is to be judged by scriptural standards. By scriptural standards. You know what that means? Right here. Check it against this. Right here. Check it against this. Does it line up with this? Does it line up with scripture? Does the, the things line up? That the things that have happened that you see, do they follow along what scripture says? If they follow along what scripture says, then listen, you've tested it out. Check it with the Holy Spirit. Pray about it. Ask the Holy Spirit to show you. Is this real? Is this something I need to look at? Is this the right thing? The whole point is that more than likely, if you are a child of God and you check it against God's Word, it's going to be revealed to you whether it's true or not. Okay? And so we need to test that out. So over in 1 John chapter 4, in verse 1, where we're at right now, it says, test out the spirits. It says, make sure that you uh, test the spirits to see whether they're from God. There are many false prophets in the world now verse 2 says and 3 says this it says by this you know the spirit of god you got to test the spirit now it's telling you how you're going to know the spirit of god by this you know the spirit of god every spirit that confesses jesus christ has come in the flesh is from god and say that again every spirit that confesses that jesus christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that it is coming and now it is already in the world. Okay, so what are we talking about here? How to know if it's a false prophet? Well, every spirit that confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh is a true spirit of God. If it does not confess that, it's false. It's anti-Christ. It is against Christ. Okay? And so, <coughs> pardon me. In John's day, John was dealing with a whole lot of stuff along those lines. John was dealing with these, these folks called um, Gnostics. Gnostics. Now, Gnostics... They, they had their own way of believing stuff, okay? And it wasn't true to the Scripture. Any Gnostic uh, teacher said that Jesus definitely uh, could be God, but he could not have become flesh. Jesus could be God, but he could not become flesh because God could not have a partnership with something that was impure, and that flesh was impure. So when they looked at that and they said that, that sounded right. That made sense. It seemed to make sense, right? Jesus definitely could be God, but God couldn't become flesh because flesh was not pure. That seemed to make sense, but it's not what God's Word said. It said in the beginning was the Word, right? And the Word became flesh. So it tells us absolutely that God sent His Son Jesus who became flesh into this world so even though what they were saying sounded right because it sounded right it turned a lot of people against what the apostles were preaching because they were saying well that can't be right you see what they're saying and what does that make them false prophets right so it makes them false prophets they were saying things that sounded like it it made really good sense but it wasn't according to scripture the scripture told us point blank that the word became flesh so if the scripture tells us that, then you can't argue that God could not be flesh when it tells us, in fact, that he did. Today, there are a lot of groups that deny that Jesus is really God. 
there's a lot of groups. The Jehovah's Witness say that Jesus is not God. The Mormons say Jesus is not God. The Muslims say Jesus is not God. Oh yeah, and the Jews also say Jesus is not God because He never came. He never came in the flesh. They're still looking for Him. They say that Jesus is the Son of God, but they say He's never come. He's never come in the flesh. So the people that we're talking about in this Scripture, the ones that John's talking to then, are still today having a problem with that. They're still today having a problem with that. We have, and when I, talk, when I say that, I'm talking about uh, there are Jews that are Messianic Jews who believe in Jesus and believe that Jesus has come, but there are those who absolutely do not believe that. So we have all these different, so, some of them so-called religions, that don't believe that Jesus ever came in the flesh. Well, right away, if we're studying Scripture and we're reading what Scripture says, that tells us it's false. That's a false religion. It's a false prophet. The, the Muslims believe that Jesus was a prophet. He was a man. He was a prophet. He never, never was it God. He was just a man. He was a good man and a good prophet, but that's it. And that's not what the Scripture says. So when we bounce that against the Scripture, what we find is we find a false Hood. We find false prophets. We find false teaching. And so every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. That means if it's not from God, it's the Antichrist. If it's not for God, it's against God, right? So when we read that and we see this, that's why it's important for us to know. It's very important for us to know this word, right? Why is it important for us to know this word? Well, many reasons, but one of which, how can we test the spirits if we don't know what the word says? How can we test it if we don't know? So it's very important for us to know God's word. Now listen, you're saying, well, you know what? I don't know everything in the Bible. Well, me neither. I don't know everything in the Bible. I've read it all the way from the front to the back, and you know what? I still don't know everything. I've read it all the way from the front to the back several times. And I still don't know everything. And I, I can tell you right now that my grandfather read this every single night of his life as long as I knew him. And he still didn't know all of it. And there's no one that can know it all. But that's why we keep studying it. Because every time we read through it, we learn more. When more is revealed. More is given. The more that we learn, the more that we know. And the more that we know, the more we learn. It just continues to be that way. And so we need to do that. That's the only way we can do that because the spirit of the Antichrist is already in this world. In 1 John chapter 2, that was mentioned. It was talking about the Antichrist. It's the spirit that opposes Jesus and offers, not only opposes Jesus, but offers a substitute Jesus. It's not Christ. It's an Antichrist, but holds up the Antichrist as if it were Christ. That's what the Antichrist is, okay? And so when we think about this, the whole point is um, we know that the Antichrist will come in the end time, okay? The Antichrist is going to be a, a political, economic ruler, someone the whole world's going to see. It's going to be lifted up with great power that everybody will see. That's the Antichrist in the end, but there are many Antichrists in the world right now. Many that are in the world right now. So we have to test out everything that we see. Every spirit that we see, we need to test it. Is it a spirit of God? Does it claim Jesus is God's Son? Does it claim Jesus is the flesh? If it doesn't claim that, this scripture we just read said, it's not true. It says if it does not confess Jesus, it is not from God. Okay? Verse 4 says, you are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. You are of God, little children. If you've given your life to Christ, you've accepted him as Lord and Savior, you have received the salvation that he's offered, then you are of God. And you have overcome them, all of them, all of those Antichrist, all of the spirit of the Antichrist. There's no reason for a Christian to fear Antichrist. There's no reason for a Christian to fear Antichrist, not any of those that are already in the world or the one who is yet to come. There's no reason for a Christian to fear. 
Why would a Christian fear something that has already been overcome? Why would you do that? Think about this. What if you were a football team, right? And you already beat this team. You already won this game. And they say, hey, let's play it again. Are you going to be scared of that team? No, you already beat them. You already overcome. You got the confidence. There's no reason for you to be afraid. You've already done it. You've already faced it. First time probably that, that you got a shot as a little child, right? Terrified of the shot. But then once you got the shot, you overcame that fear, right? Some of them. Some people still got that fear, right? All these things that we overcome, why do we need to continue to be afraid if we have already overcome? There's no reason to be afraid of the Antichrist if we are children of God because God has overcome and the Antichrist can't do anything about it. So why should we fear? We should have no fear of the Antichrist. The spirit in us is greater than he who is in the world. That's Satan and all of his allies. God's spirit is greater than every bit of that. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So, here's the thing. If we rely on the one that's in us instead of relying on ourselves, then, hey, everything's going to be good. But when we start trying to rely on self instead of relying on the one that dwells in us, that's when we start having problems. Because we start trying to put self first, right? We start trying to put ourselves up and think, well, we got this. Well, you do if you're re relying on the one that's in you. Right? But not if you're relying on self. You've got to rely on God. Because He has overcome all. He's overcome all of that. So, as a Christian, we don't have a place for fear. We shouldn't be in fear. We shouldn't live in fear. We shouldn't be afraid of the world. We shouldn't be afraid of all of that. The whole point is that if God lives in us, then who can be against us, right? Scripture says if God's for us, who can be against us? So why do we fear? Yet Christians are terrified of so many things in the world. A Christian is terrified many times to witness to another person. They're terrified to witness to someone. Why? Well, what if I say something wrong? Well, that happens. You're not perfect. You can say something wrong, but you can still go back and say, well, let's look it up. Let's find it in God's Word. Let's talk about it together. You can open your mouth. Here's what you ought to be afraid of. What you ought to be afraid of is what if I don't tell this person and they die? That's where the only fear you should have is that person dying not knowing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That should be the greatest fear that we have is knowing that there are people in the world that don't know Christ and we haven't told them about it. We haven't told about it. You make mistakes. When you witness, you can make mistakes. Listen, I went out doing faith evangelism one time, and you know you got every letter, you got to tell them something about that letter. And uh, had a preacher friend that told me, said, first time I went out, and he was a preacher. He said, first time I went out, I got nervous trying to do the thing, and I, I, I messed up, and I just spelled fat. He said, I couldn't remember all the letters. I just spelled fat. But guess what? The person got saved. So it didn't matter. It wasn't about him anyway. It was about Jesus. And even though he couldn't remember all the letters, through what he did do, God used it and the person got saved. So the fear that we put in place so many times is a fear that we put there that doesn't need to be there. It needs to be overcome. And it can be overcome because the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. Look at verse 5 and 6. It says, They are from the world. Therefore, they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. He who knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay? By this, we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Okay? So they are in the world. Those who are of the world. That's who he's talking about there. Those who are of the world. They're evident because they speak as the world. They speak as the world. They talk as the world. We're not talking about the world um, being the, the dirt and the grass and the trees and all that. We're talking about the world being lost in the world. We're talking about the world being the sin in the world. We're talking about all of that. And so when they speak, they speak as the world. They don't know uh, Jesus and they speak as lost people. 
Um, and so it's evident. We can see that. And the world hears them and the world loves them, right? All is good. All is good. The world hears them. Christians always will talk to the world and bring the gospel to the world. But the thing is, how are they going to hear us if we're speaking like the world? How are they going to understand and hear us and see anything we have to say if what we're saying sounds just like somebody who's not of God? How will they know? How will they look at you and think there's anything different? There won't be. So as we speak, we speak from God. And so when we do that, we do these things, then we can speak to the people. The world hears them. Now here's the thing. He who knows God hears us. He who knows God hears us. He listens to us. That means that if you know God and you're speaking to someone who knows God, we hear one another. We understand what we're saying, right? We understand that. We have this, this, this communication between us because we know the same Father. We have that. It says, he who knows God, um, who uh, listens to us, but he who is not from God does not listen. Now, what they mean is when they say that, they don't listen to us, meaning they wouldn't listen to us on our own. They wouldn't listen to us on our own because we're not like them. We're not of the world. We're of God. And so the world's not going to listen to us on our own. They're not going to do that because what they're going to see is they're going to see something that that is not what they agree in or what they think, and so they just won't listen. They who are of God enjoy fellowship with one another. We reach out with one another. We understand each other. But those who are not of God do not hear us. Now, here's the whole thing. God taught us through the apostles to help us know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So if someone hears what God has said in the Bible, we know he has the spirit of truth. If he does not hear it, he has the spirit of error. So here's what we're saying. How many times have you ever gone out and witnessed to someone and they rejected it? Happens, right? So in that case, we know that they don't have the spirit of God. They have the spirit of error. They didn't hear you. They didn't listen to you. They know nothing about it. But if you witness to them and they accept Jesus, then what has happened at that point is they have been filled with the Spirit and now they have the Spirit of God. Now they heard you. See, people believe, so many times, people believe that it's it's their choice. They can just decide whenever they want to whether they're going to accept Jesus or not. But the real reality is until the Holy Spirit opens your eyes, you will never accept Jesus. You will never see Him. You will never see Him. And so what he's saying here is those who don't have the Spirit of God, God has not come upon them and opened their eyes, they still are in the spirit of error, and they will not hear what a Christian is trying to tell them. But once God has opened their eyes and the Holy Spirit has come upon them, now they have the Spirit of God, and they will hear it. They will hear it when you speak to them. They will come to know you. And so that's the incredible thing is that God will open that door. We can we can make the most... Um, absolute best argument in the whole world if we were on a debate team about why you should accept Jesus. And the person could sit right across from us and go, no. No. But it's logical, don't you? And you can show them every bit of logic. You can put everything out in front of them. You can do all of that. And a person can still look at you and go, no. They don't get it. They absolutely don't get it. And it's just as if you were speaking a foreign language and they didn't understand anything that you said. They don't get it. And you say, I can't make it any more plain. I don't understand how you can't accept this because their eyes have not been opened by the Spirit. And when their eyes have not been opened by the Spirit, then they're in the spirit of error and the spirit of God. And in that point, they're not going to receive it. They're not going to listen to you until they're in the spirit of God. And so we need to know that. We need to understand that. That means we don't know who God the Spirit has spoken to and who the Spirit hasn't spoken to. Therefore, we need to talk to all of them. Right? We need to speak to all of them. Because we don't know who the Spirit's spoken to. And so we continue every chance we get to witness to people. Now look with me to verse 7 and 8. 7 and 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another. 
For love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So, let us love God. So, in, in, in the ancient Greek, this sentence begins like this. Um, agapatoi, agap, uh, agapamen. And it says, those who are loved, let us love. Those who are loved, let us love. So, beloved, that's those who are loved, let us love. That's what, in the Greek, that's what it says. Um, and so, when we read that and we see that, it says, we are, we're not commanded to love one another to earn or become worthy of God's love. We love each other because we are loved by God. Did you, did you get that? We, we can't love each other to earn one another's love. We love each other because we are first loved by God. That's why we love one another. Because we are first loved by God. we got to learn how to love. How are we going to know how to love if God doesn't love us? If we don't see the love of God, how can we love one another? So, beloved, let us love one another. Love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God. Well, wait a minute now. What do you, what do you mean about that? Everyone who loves is, is born of God. That's, that's a little... Seems a little strange. And there are people that are not Christians that they love people. I mean, they got families and, you know, all of that. So um, that seems as if that would be the way it is. Um, everyone who loves is born of God, but he who does not love does not know God. What does that mean? Well, here's the thing. Every display of love that's in the world, every display of love that's in the world is not always a display of true love. Only true love comes from Christians. And those are the real acts of love. Men created in God's image, and because we're created in God's image, then um, we are able to love like he loves. Okay, But things came into the world, thing called sin, right? And since sin came into the world, the, there are those who do not know God, who have not given themselves to God. They display what they know as love, but it's not true love. It's not a true love, and they can't find a true love until they have given their lives to God. Until they give their lives to God. Um, John talks about, and when love is of God, John's talking about that word agape. That word agape is, is a godly love, a self-giving love that loves without expecting anything back. It's a love that loves without expecting anything back at all. And since God gives us that love, we're supposed to love one another in that same way. In exactly that same way. God is love. You ever heard that before? God is love. God is love. There are people who use that phrase. It says so right here. God is love. But there are people that use that phrase to mean that, that certainly there can't be any, anything that will be against people. There can't be a hell. There can't be, people can't be hold, held accountable for any sin because God is love. I mean, if God loves us, certainly uh, he wouldn't allow us to go to hell. Certainly there, there wouldn't be, the sin wouldn't be something that would be a problem if God loves us. Love conquers all, right? Scripture says that. So we're looking at this. Well, if God is love, then that means that he can't, there's nothing that, that could be wrong about that. But I want us to understand this. We're not saying, um, when we say God is love, love is an aspect of his character. It's an aspect of his character. It doesn't eliminate his holiness. It doesn't eliminate his righteousness. And it doesn't eliminate his perfect justice. It doesn't eliminate any of those things. Instead, um, holiness of God is loving. Righteousness of God is loving. Justice of God is loving. Everything that God does is loving, even though it may be righteous and holy and justice. Those things are still going on, right? Uh, anybody in here besides me ever get a, a spanking as a child? <laughs> One or two? Mm. Brother Dean, you didn't get no spankings? Okay, you got, I was going to say. Got a spanking. And when you when your parents spank you, they tell you, I do this because I love you. It didn't feel like love, did it? Didn't feel a bit like love. I, I don't anybody ever get spanked with a switch? I had to pick my own. Yeah. Don't get one that's 
I had to pick my own. When I got when I got in trouble and got the switch, I had to pick my own. I still remember the uh, I called it the switch dance. Y'all know the switch dance because you had to drop your pants, you know, and she start down at the ankles and work up to the behind and back down again, and you, <laughs> the whole time, and it didn't help a bit. It didn't help at all. You got the switch dance, and they say, I did this because I love you. And at the time, it showed didn't feel much like love. But you know what? It was love. Because it corrected a wrong in my life. Whatever it was that I disobeyed or did wrong or made a mistake, it corrected that and helped me to remember, don't do it again. And did you know that God switches us too? God puts that discipline on us. He puts that justice on us. Now, He doesn't send us out and pick a switch and do it physically like our parents did. But He, he puts punishment on us sometimes. He puts the stuff on us and, and sometimes makes us wish we'd had a switch instead. God puts that on us because He loves us. And even in His justice, God is love. So, the fact that He's love doesn't negate all of these other things. It means that all of the things He does are in love. He is love. Everything about that is love. It's a glorious, glorious truth. And so when we think about that, we understand that God is love. But here's the thing. God gave the fullest proof of His love. The fullest proof of His love in Jesus Christ. In His only Son. It was the fullest proof of His love when He sent His Son who tasted death for every person. For every single person. And in all of those things, any of the human race can accept Jesus now. So understand that the whole thing is there's no limit to God's love. There's no boundaries. There's nothing that stops it. And everything that does, God does it in love. And every person that ever has been on this earth or ever will be has an opportunity to accept that love. There, the, the, the real point is that only people who know God understand true love. So <clears throat> we as believers in Christ, if we know that love, we've received that love from God, then we need to share that love with other people. Because the number one thing, the number one thing when they ask people, what is the one thing that you want most in your life? The number one answer is to be loved. To be loved. I just want to be loved. That's the number one thing. I want to be loved. Well, you got a Father in Heaven that loves you. He loves you so much He sent His Son down to earth as a flesh, as a person, as a human. And then He allowed Him to die on a cross for your sin and mine and every person ever has or will live. He loves you that much. He loves you more than any human being ever could. He loves you more than all of that. And if we know that and we don't give love to other people who are seeking it so desperately, then how in the world are we going to show people the true God? How are we going to do that? Look at 9 through 11. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we loved, but that God, uh, but not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. <clears throat> Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. All right. So let's look at this whole passage here. It says the God love of God was manifested to us. He sent His only Son. So, there's a couple things that I want us to see about this. How much did God love us? He loved us enough that He sent His Son. But the Bible doesn't say He sent His Son. It puts another word in there. It puts another word. It says He sent His only begotten Son. Right? He sent His only begotten Son. He sent his son, that begotten means it's a special term that means sonship that is unique 
And it is only through the Father. That's the only way that He is who He is. It's through God. So His begotten Son, His only begotten Son, He sent into this world. Why did He send Him into this world? To become flesh. He sent Him in this world to become flesh. You know, there's something that um, most of us probably overlook. We overlook when we think about well, God sent His Son into the world to become flesh, and we all we understand that you know God um, He died for us and all all of those things, and we maybe we come to an understanding of that, and we know that God uh, said that He had to turn away when He was uh, became sin because He can't look on sin. Maybe we get all that, but think about this: God sent this special relationship, this Son of His, this only begotten Son, into a dirty, rotten, sinful world. And then he took the most holy, righteous, gorgeous creature there was and put him in this old nasty, rotten flesh. Sin. Look, how many of you have children? You got children. How many of you would say, you know what? Today... I'm going to clothe you. And you go outside and you find some clothes that have been laying on the, on, out in the field with a dead animal wrapped up in them that stink to high heavens. They're literally falling into shreds. And you pick it up and bring it in and put it on your child and say, now, here, I want you to wear this today. Anybody would go do that? No, we wouldn't go do that. That's disgusting. Why would we pick up something that's nasty and put it on our child? God did that. This skin that we hold so dear, you know, we stand in the mirror and we fix our mustache and beard and our hair and we, you know, put on cleanser to clean our skin and do all the things and, you know, we, we think so much of it. To God, it's rotten. And He sent His Son and put that rotten, nasty mess on His Son in this world for one purpose and one purpose only. To die for you and me. God gave His only begotten Son. Not only did He send Him to die, but in the meantime, He put this disgusting stuff on Him, sent Him into the world that hated Him, by the way. The world hated Him. The world did not love Him. The world hated Him from the time He came into the world. Because he represented everything that they knew was wrong. The world hated him. He came into this world and they didn't, it was after him. The whole scripture, they're looking for a way to get rid of him. And eventually they did, right? But it was by his design. Sent him into this world. The world hated him, did all of that. Why? So that he would eventually die for us. Die a terrible, horrible death. There's not a parent alive today that would say, I would love to put my child on a cross like Jesus. No. There's nobody that would do that. God did it. He did it for us. He put His Son on the cross after He made Him go through all of the terrible, horrible things that He went through. And Let me back up. Let me rephrase that. After He sent Him and gave Him the mission to do that, which Jesus accepted and did willingly. Jesus could have stopped at any time. He could have said no, but He didn't. He continued on, even to the point of on the cross. The Scripture tells us He could have called legions of angels to pull Him off the cross, but He did it. He went through it. God sent Him and said, this is the way it's going to be. It's going to be bad. But if you go and do this, you're going to save all of these creations. And Jesus went. God sent His only begotten Son into this world. He sent His Son to be the sacrifice that we should have been. He sent Him to take the punishment for our sins. He sent Him to be on a cross to get rid of all of it. So is this love? Yes. It's absolute love. Real love. Agape love. It is love. Not by our love for God, but God's love for us. That's the love that we're talking about in this passage. If God so loved, He so loved, He loved us that much that He did every bit of that. John was familiar with this um, in some ways because you remember in the, in the, at the Last Supper when um, uh, Jesus washed the disciples' feet, He put Himself by, below everybody else and washed the disciples' feet. That's the kind of love that we're supposed to be showing instead of putting ourselves up above those things. 
So when we look at all this, this love, this absolute love that God gave us, that we not because of how we loved Him, because He loved us, this absolute love, if we have that love, which we do, we are capable of, if we have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, if we have this love, then we need to put it into practice. Because if we have that love, it will lead to practical action. Now here's the thing. Has anybody ever offended you? That kind of love seeks reconciliation. That kind of love seeks reconciliation. Has anybody insulted you? That kind of love forgives. Every bit of this that we're talking about, if anybody has ever mistreated you, that kind of love forgives. It seeks reconciliation. It seeks a relationship. That type of love does. And so that's how we put that love into practical work. We want to live our lives in a way that others would see Jesus in us, that God's love flows out of us, that others would know who we are by the love we show one for another. That's how we want to love. God is love. We started off this passage talking about testing the spirits. How do you test in the spirits? By what you see. What do you see? The love of God. Do you see that love of God coming out of people? Then they are of God. You don't see that love of God coming out of people, then they're not of God. So that's what we have to make sure that we test that. We understand the love that God is. God is love and everything that he does is love. Even if it's a spanking. Is still love. Verse 12, no one has seen God at any time. Y'all understand that? You hear what I said? No one has seen God at any time. Moses saw the back of him, didn't he? but he didn't see him. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides in us and His love is perfected in us. So the whole point is we haven't seen God, but we've seen God's love. Okay? That's what I want us to understand. John basically says um, nobody has ever seen God at any time. So anyone claiming to have seen God is speaking from their imagination. <laughs> they haven't actually ever seen Him as far as physically seen Him. They haven't ever seen Him, but they've seen His love. They've seen the evidence of God. They've seen all of those things. And so when, when uh, Paul, when he was talking about God the Father, he said, um, now to the King, eternal, immortal, and invisible. Jesus declared of God the Father, God is spirit. Meaning that God the Father has no tangible body which may be seen. So if we know that God is invisible and we know that we haven't seen Him but yet He still loves us and all of the things that He gives us, then we absolutely should love Him. No one has seen the Holy Spirit either. But we know He's there. No one has seen Him, but we know He's there. He's represented Himself in all kinds of ways. Jesus was seen by many walking on this earth in the fleshly body. In the fleshly body. But He sent him so that he might die for us. He walked in the fleshly body. But Jesus himself testified um, that no one has seen the Father. <clears throat> Here's the, the, the thing that, that we have to hold on to with that. We may have never seen him. In fact, it says we've never seen him. But we've seen the love that He gives us. And we've seen the Spirit through how the Spirit lives in us. We've seen all of those things. So if we've seen all of that, and we know that He's here, and He's not in that fleshly body, but of the Spirit, then the Spirit can abide in us. And we can abide in the Spirit. Right? So if the Spirit abides in us and we abide in the Spirit, then therefore we're going to walk as we're called to walk. We're going to love one another just as we're called to love one another. We can be perfected in that love. We can be perfected in that Spirit and in that power. Now, um, it says in, in, in um, 1 
verse 12 at the end, it says, His love is perfected in us. The Greek word for that is uh, teleu, which doesn't mean perfect as mature and complete. It, it, it doesn't mean perfect as much as it means mature or complete. Okay? So we think of perfect someone who never makes mistakes, right? But it's talking about perfect as being mature and complete. That the Spirit makes us perfect. It says that here that uh, God's love is perfected in us. It makes it mature. It makes it complete. God's love in us. Without it, we can't have that. Without it, we can't do that. If we walk in God and He walks in us, then together we can walk in that way. Look at verse 13 to 15 where it says, By this we know that we abide in Him and He in us, because He has given us of His Spirit. We have seen and testify that the Father has sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in Him and He in God. So again, that there we're talking about that abiding in him. John talks about that in, in uh, his other book. In John chapter 15, he says, Abide in me and I in you. Um, so we abide in him and he abides in us. It's perfected. We love one another. We walk in a way that others see Jesus in us. Um, we, can, we can love as great as we can possibly love on this side of eternity if we walk in that way. But we've got to walk in that way. He's given his spirit. He's given His Spirit, the Holy Spirit. When Jesus went back to heaven, He said, I send a helper, right? He said, I'm sending this helper to you, one that's going to come and be with you. And the Holy Spirit um, inside of us makes it possible for us to know that we abide in Him. It makes it very possible. Paul says in Romans 8, 16, the Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. That's, that's when we know when the Spirit abides in us, and we can tell that, we can see that. Um, and so we understand that God and sending Jesus, the Savior of the world, the Spirit that's in us, the Holy Spirit, He's given us His Spirit. And so, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> All right. <coughs> So there's three essential truths about God that John has declared and, and, and how he saves us. He said the Father sent the Son, that Jesus was sent as the Savior of the world. Knowing and understanding Jesus is the foundation for abiding in Him. These are the three things. The Father sent the Son, Jesus was sent as the Savior, and knowing and understanding Jesus is the foundation for abiding in Him. So whoever confesses Jesus as the Son of God, God abides in Him and, and He in God. <clears throat> so that's how we know people ask well how do I know I hope I go into heaven I hope I know Jesus I hope that I've done enough how do you know does the spirit abide in you you can know that you can absolutely know that is it true do you believe in that and you see that all of those things those things I just talked about then you can in fact abide in him in verse 16 it says we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. This is what we've been talking about this whole time. So the perfecting love in verse 17 and 18 says, By this, love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment. What I just say about knowing that you're saved, it says, Love is perfected with us, so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves punishment, and the one who fears is not perfected in love. And so when we look at all of that and we understand it's the perfection that we're talking about, the maturity that God has given us, the completeness that he's put in our life, it's all so that we may have the boldness in the day of judgment and understand that we will never know hell if we know Jesus. We will never know that. We can know 100% that in that day of judgment, we don't have to be afraid. Verse 19 says, we love because he first loved us. Amen? Yeah. We love because he first loved us. That's the only way that we can love because he first, in fact, loved us. And so when we understand that, that that's the only way that we can have true love, then we can walk in a love that's incredible. We love because he first loved us. So look with me at verse 20 and 21, and we'll wrap this up. 
20 and 21 says, If someone says, I love God and hate his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, who he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Now, to me it doesn't get any simpler than that. How can someone say, I love God, but still hate their brother? How can they do that? And we have people all over the world who call themselves Christians and they say that they are believers in Jesus Christ and they are as racist as the day is long. They hate their brother simply because of their skin color, their background, who they uh, were born into, what family, what part of the country they're in, all of those things. How can you love God and hate your brother? The scripture says if you say that and you hate your brother, you're a liar. Absolute. It didn't pull any punches. He didn't say it could be. It may be. He said he is. He's a liar. Do you love God? If you love God, then you must love people. And if you say, I hate my brother, then, then you need to go back and figure out uh, wh where you're at because you don't love God. If you hate your brother, it's not possible. How can you uh, hate someone you have seen and love somebody you've never seen? You can't do that. So, for us, as we take heart in this chapter tonight, I know we went over it uh, a little quickly, but the thing that I want us to see in all of this is it's all about abiding in love and God's love and understanding that if we know Him and if He is part of us, He abides in us and we abide in Him. When We don't have to worry about eternity. We don't have to worry when the day of judgment comes. We don't have to be afraid because we can know. And if we know, then it's going to be evident. It, what we will see, test the spirit. What spirit do they have? Do they have the spirit of love or spirit of hate? What do they have? What do you see? If they don't love God and they don't say that Jesus is God's son who came in the flesh, then it is a false prophet. Just as simply as that. So people need to look at themselves as well. Do you believe those things? Have you accepted those things? He said, if you say that Jesus is God's son and that he was in the flesh, then you are of God. Then you are a child of God. So we don't have to wonder. That's why I tell people, read the book of 1 John. It will help you come to a place where you can absolutely be certain of your salvation. So for those of you who've joined us online tonight, I hope and pray that you uh, are certain of your salvation. I hope and pray that you know that Jesus is the Son of God, that he sent him in this earth as flesh, who walked in this world, died on the cross, was buried and resurrected on the third day, that you might have life and have it abundantly. If you don't know him, but you want to talk about it, please uh, send me a message on Facebook. Uh, let me know, and I would love to get back in touch with you and talk to you about it. For those of you that are online tonight, we thank you for being here. God bless and good night.